Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody, welcome back for some more quantum angular momentum. Today we're going to finish our characterization of the eigenvalue eigenvector structure for j squared and j3. So, I can't emphasize enough that um, the structure comes from the commutation relations of j3 and j squared with uh, the latter operators j plus and j minus and that's encapsulated in this proposition 4. But equally important, remember last time, is this corollary. This gave us bounds, this had to be greater than or equal to 0, this gave us bounds on a, the eigenvalue corresponding to j squared, and m, the eigenvalue corresponding to j3. Now this expression involves j minus j plus in a particular order, but because a has to be, this, this expression on the right has to be bigger than or equal to zero, a has to be larger than the maximum of the two. So we have a very nice diagram which essentially is the key to understanding everything about quantum angular momentum. So for a fixed A, we can see that we have a maximum and a minimum value. We call those J and minus J. That's important. M has a maximum and minimum value minus j to j. j is positive. So if we look at, if we examine that those expressions in the corollary a bit more closely and the diagram, we can see that a has to be j times j plus 1. So we're now going to use this notation rather than a for the eigenvalue of j squared. So this is the expressions we've already developed. Okay. Now if we take this out value of a, j times j plus 1, and plug it back into the expression for the corollary, we get these nice expressions which give us a clear, much more clear relation between the maximum and minimum values of m, which is j and minus j, and m itself. It gives us a constraint. So what we're going to look at are the situations where the extreme is satisfied, so that so j plus acting on ket j m is zero, and at the other end, j minus acting on ket j m is zero. So let's look at j plus acting on ket j m when it's zero. So if you look at this expression, you have two choices, either j equal m, J, j minus m equals 0, or j plus m plus 1 equals 0. But it has to be this expression, because otherwise you would violate the expression for the bounds. Okay. Then we can look at j minus. So we, we have, summarizing, j plus acting on j m is 0 if and only if m equals j. That makes sense. That's the maximum value of m. So going to the other end, you can similarly prove that j minus act, j m acting on m, and you should be able to guess what the answer is. If and only if m equal minus j. That's the lower bound. Now, if you use those commutation relations in proposition 4, you can easily see that if j3 acts on j plus or minus m, that's where I've used a commutation relation right there. I get what? I get m plus or minus 1, h bar, j plus or minus, acting on ket jm. So, as long as it's not 0, j plus acting on jm gives us an eigenvector of j3 with eigenvalue increased by 1, m plus 1. Similarly, 
j squared acting on j plus or minus jm, we see that j plus or minus acting on ket jm, I'm being a little sloppy with my terminology there, is gives us an eigenvalue, but it's an eigenvector of j squared. So if we summarize j plus acting on ket jm, if it doesn't vanish, then it's an eigenvector of j squared and j3 with eigenvalues j plus j times j plus 1 h bar squared and m plus 1 h bar respectively. The important point is j, j plus does not change j, but it decreases, it uh, increases m by 1, j plus increases. Similarly, if j minus jm does not vanish, then it's an eigenvector of j, both j squared and j3 with eigenvalue j times j plus 1 h bar squared and m minus 1 h bar. So j minus doesn't do anything to j, but it decreases m by 1. Okay. Now, if we repeatedly act on ket jm with j plus, we're going to get a sequence of eigenvectors, and it's going to have to terminate. Otherwise, we'd violate the bounds. Okay. And so, it's got. We have two choices. It terminates at m plus n m plus n. 1 equals j, or, well, or m equals j minus n1. It has to do that because that's the end of the bounds for uh, m between minus j and j. Okay, we can let j minus act on jm. We get a sequence of eigenvectors, and that terminates at m equal minus j plus an integer. And if we put those two integer two conditions together, we see that 2j has to be a positive integer. So the only values allowed for j, which is positive, are 0, a half, 1, 3 halves, and so on. Now, that's just what the commutator, commutation relations tell us. So, let me summarize this in the theorem we have here. And this is the basically the characterization which I pointed to that we've been trying to get after the last couple of lectures. The operator j squared has eigenvalues j times j plus 1 h bar squared. And j takes on, can take on these values. For each j, fixed j, we have two j plus one eigenvectors because m can go from minus j to j. Okay. And so this is the characterization we have. So, the part in black bold is important. A gi for a given application, it doesn't tell us all these j's have to occur. It just tells us the possible j's that can occur. And it's up to us to look at the particular application and see what values of total angular momentum that will fix the values of m that are allowed. Okay, that is a good place to stop right now and we'll pick up next time with uh, a technical difficulty we'll do that quickly and then we'll talk about matrix representations for j squared and j3 using this mat this uh, this eigenvalue structure okay see you next time bye